All right, let's see here. Hmm. Okay, let's see what else there is. Hmm, what's this? Is that word repent, it literally just means to change your mind, to feel so good. Oh, yeah. I'll just save this for later. It's time to be free. Good morning. Good morning. It is good to see you. I was, you so sweet. I said, thank you very much. You're very sweet. Thank you very much. Thank you. Y'all are very sweet. Well, I said to Pastor Jimmy, thank you very much. You're very sweet. Yes, this is. It. I said to Pastor Jimmy Witcher, I said, you're going to stand up and introduce me? And he said, no. And I thought, well, they don't even know who I am anymore. So thank you, Albert. You're very sweet. It is wonderful to be here. It's always wonderful to be in Amarillo and to be here with Trinity. Jimmy and Kim Witcher are our dear friends. They have been so wonderful to Karen and me. Uh, what wonderful pastors they are of this church. They're just wonderful. And I'm just so proud of them and just so proud of what God is doing here. And uh, I can't believe how many people are here, honestly. I think this is the most people I've seen in a room since COVID started. So anyway, it's good, good to see you. Okay, well, I have a, I'm going to be here this week, and then Pastor Jimmy and I are doing this series together, and I'll be here back here in a couple weeks. This, this uh, sermon is called A Mindset Free. I want to talk to you about your thought life and talk to you about the importance of your thought life. And this is John 19, where we'll start. And uh, it says, And he bearing his cross went out to a place called the place of a skull, which is in Hebrew called Golgotha, where they crucified him and two others with him, one on either side, uh, and Jesus in the center. And so Jesus was crucified on a place that looks like a human skull. Now, if you've been to Jerusalem, you can actually see Golgotha from the Temple Mount, and it's, it's eerie. It looks like a human skull. And you say, well, why would Jesus die on a place? Because it could have looked like an arm or a hand or a foot. Why in the world was Jesus crucified on a place that looked like a human skull? And that's because mankind fell in our thoughts. When Satan came into the Garden of Eden, he came to Eve and he said, has God surely said? He didn't attack her body. He didn't attack her emotions. He attacked her mind. He came to her with a lie. God had given Adam and Eve the truth, and he now came with a lie, and they believed the lie, and they fell. Their minds fell. And this is why Jesus said in John 8, 32, and you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Let me say something. If your mind isn't free, you're not free. If your, if your mind isn't free, no area of your life is going to be free until your mind is free. And so the death of Jesus, when Jesus came to free mankind and they pierced him in the side and water and blood flowed from him, it hit the top of a human skull. And what that was a picture of, Jesus came to redeem our thoughts so that we can live our lives the way God wants us to live our lives. Our full and free victory came through the death of Jesus. So I want to talk about three main issues as it relates to your mind being set free. And the first is this. Understanding the mind is the main battlefield of good and evil. Now, Satan, every day, when he comes to attack you and me, he attacks our thoughts. That's where he attacks us. 2 Corinthians 10. Though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. And so the weapons of our warfare are not guns and knives and bombs. The weapons of our warfare are divinely powerful so that we can come against the arguments and the thoughts that Satan puts in our minds that come against the knowledge of God. So a stronghold is a thought in your mind that doesn't agree with the Bible. It's very simple. Any thought in our minds that doesn't agree with the Bible is a stronghold. A bondage is a house of thoughts. So if you have a bondage of lust or a bondage of worry or a bondage of fear or a bondage of the fear of man or a bondage of claustrophobia or all kinds of fears, it's just a house of thoughts. That's all it is. 
And in order for that bondage to be dealt with, you have to take those thoughts captive before the Lord. Let me give you an example of this. Lust, worry, fear, anger, compulsions, addictions, depression, low self-image, negativity, unbelief, unforgiveness, bitterness. You cannot solve a spiritual problem with your flesh. You can't solve anger with your flesh. You can't solve lust with your flesh. You can't solve fear. The only way you can deal with a spiritual problem is with a spiritual solution. And so God's power, the power of God's word, is what overcomes uh, every bondage of the devil. And so what, the, what 2 Corinthians is saying is this. First of all, we have to allow Christ to decide what stays in our mind. When it says we're taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ, it's, obedience there is the word hypokoi. It means to listen under. Every thought that comes into my mind, I have to take it captive and submit it to Jesus Christ. Now listen to me. Any thought that you don't take captive will take you captive. Let me say it another way. Any thought that you haven't taken captive has you captive right now. Any thought, any rogue thought, and there should not be any rogue thoughts within our minds. Every thought that comes, and, and by the way, any person can have any thought. Just because you have a bad thought doesn't mean you're a bad person. The reason that you have bad thoughts sometimes is because there's an evil devil trying to kill you. He's trying to destroy your life. So even if you're a really good person, really pure person, you can still have very impure thoughts because the devil, see, the, the, here's the old saying, a bird can fly through any barn. You just don't want to build a nest for it. And so any thought can go through any person's mind. You just don't want to become a home for that thought. And so any thought that comes through my mind, I have to understand if this is not a thought from God, it's going to take me captive. It's not just going to take me captive. It's going to take my marriage captive, my children captive, my body captive, my emotions captive. It's going to take me captive. And the only way out of that bondage is to deal with the thoughts. The second is uh, we have to listen to what the Word of God says. Hupekoi. When a thought comes through my mind, by the way, the word captive says we're taking every thought captive. That word means spear point. Every thought that comes into my mind, I have to put a spear under its neck and say, you're going to listen to what Jesus has to say. I'm taking, listen, God can't take your thoughts captive, and the devil can't take your thoughts captive. You're the only person that can do it. If you don't take your thoughts captive, nobody else can do it for you. So our, the weapons of our warfare are not guns and bombs and knives. The weapons of our warfare are every time a thought comes through my mind, I'm going to scrutinize that thought. I am going to force it under Jesus, and it will listen to what Jesus has to say. And every thought that stays in my mind is a thought that agrees with the Word of God. And any thought that doesn't agree with the Word of God, I kick it out. That's the warfare that we face every day. So here, that's the first thing, is our minds are the main battlefield that Satan wants to face us on. The second is this, understanding the Word of God is a spiritual weapon. So this is Ephesians 6, 10 through 17. By the way, all the online people, all the campuses, welcome to all of you guys. We're glad that you're joining us. Understanding the word of God is a spiritual weapon. Ephesians 6, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above, above all, take the shield of faith uh, with which you'll be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So the Word of God is our weapon. It's the only offensive weapon given by Paul. This is Roman soldiers' uh, uh, armor that he's talking about here. Helmet of salvation. What does helmet of salvation mean? You think like a saved person. You have to think like a person who is saved and put off your old mind. That's what keeps Satan from being able to attack your, your thoughts. Shield of faith. You have the shield of faith here. You have the word of God here. Faith in the word is what protects you against Satan. Your loins are girded with truth. This is where they put their sword. This is where you would hang your sword. What does it mean to have your loins girded with truth? This is the part of our body where we reproduce and eliminate. When your loins are girded with the word of God, you naturally reproduce truth and eliminate error. When your loins are not girded with truth, you reproduce error and eliminate truth. 
And so everything we do, my mind is, is covered by the Word of God. My, I, I have a shield of faith. My loins are girded with truth. I am ready for war. war. And what uh, Paul is saying here is you're not battling against human beings. You're battling against spiritual forces. And those spiritual forces are going to come against you. And when they do, you better be ready. And the thing that's going to make you most ready is faith in the Word of God. And using the Word of God as an offensive weapon, defending on, d- depending on it. So this is Hebrews 4. For the Word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even through the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. So the way that we view the Bible is critical in our everyday lives. And so, so like, for example, some people just don't believe the Bible is special at all. They see the Bible as a, a, a fairy tale book of just a book of stories and things like that. Well, see, that's what the devil wants. The, first of all, the devil wants you to reject the Word of God completely. And we're not living in an anti biblical or an unbiblical society. We're living in an anti biblical society. Our society is against the Word of God. Listen, you without the Word of God, you are defenseless against the devil. Without the Word of God, you have no way to defend yourself. So some people just kind of have a casual relationship with the Word of God. It's, you're called devil food. <laughs> He's gonna, he is going to ruin your life and take you out, and you're going to be absolutely helpless against it. So listen to this. So Jesus in the wilderness, this is Luke 4 and, and Matthew 4, Jesus was in the wilderness. Now this is Jesus himself and Satan himself. And Satan came to him three different times, you remember, and he tempted him. And every time Jesus tempted him, Jesus, or every time Satan tempted him, Jesus said, it is written. It is written. Did you realize that every time Satan tried to tempt Jesus, he quoted a scripture to him? Do you understand that the word of God is nuclear in the spirit realm? Hebrews 11 says, by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. You understand the entire universe was created by the word of God. In John chapter 1 it says that Jesus, nothing was created that was not created by Jesus, the word of God. Do you understand that every, this pulpit here, every part of this pulpit, every part of it that was made was made out of something that the word of God produced. The word of God is the most powerful force in the universe. The word of God controls the universe and every being in the universe. And Jesus fought the devil in the wilderness and beat him with three scriptures. If Jesus had to use the scriptures against the devil, do you think we don't have to use the scriptures against the devil? And if you don't know the scriptures, if you have a casual relationship with the word of God and you're not prepared to fight and the devil comes to you and says, you're no good, you, your life doesn't matter, you know, your God is against you and all, that's not what the word says. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says you were fearfully and wonderfully made and the thoughts that God had for you in your mother's womb were so many that they're like the sand of the seashore, they can't be numbered. Do you understand you're not an afterthought? Do you understand that your life is so important that God detailed every moment of your life before you have ever had one day on this earth? I mean, there are volumes and volumes that God wrote about your life. And the devil wants to convince you that you're no good. You know why he wants to? It's because God created you to do something great with your life. And the devil wants to convince you that you're not special, that you've done too much to be forgiven, that you're no good, that you're not like other people. And I was a member of this congregation when I was 25 years old. And I remember I used to say, I was struggling. I was struggling with lots of stuff. Still trying to stop smoking. I I quit last week. Uh, I mean, I was was struggling with all kinds of stuff. I sit on the back row back there. I, I worked in the sound booth, by the way. And I used to think, God could just never use me. Does God use me? Yes, he does. But I remember when I sat back on the back row wondering if God could ever use me. God can use you. And Satan will come against you with every single thing he has to try to convince you 
you can't be forgiven, you're no good, God doesn't love you, so on and so on and so on, and that is the exact opposite of the truth. And when he comes against you with those kinds of thoughts, you have to take that thought captive. You have to take that thought and force it to listen to the word of God. And any thought that doesn't agree with the Bible is not a thought that God is giving you. And so let me talk for just a minute about biblical meditation and, and the importance of biblical meditation. This is Psalm chapter 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also does not wither, and whatever he does prospers. Now, this is talking about the person who meditates in the Word of God day and night, and I want to talk to you about biblical meditation. But here's the promise of verse 3. Whatever you do will prosper. Now, what would you give if I could ensure you that every single thing you did in life prospered? Your career, your parenting, your physical health. What if I could say to you, I'm going to give you a secret, and that secret will ensure that you prosper in every area of your life. Would you give a little bit for that? Well, no, this is free. This is free. And it says, blessed is the man who does, does not walk in the counsel of the un ungodly, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and he meditates in it day and night. Now, can I say something to you? Because when I first heard this scripture, I thought, I can't do that. I can't. I'm not that kind of a person. I enjoy sports, and I don't want to meditate all day because I need to watch sports. I need to watch the Cowboys lose. <laughs> Stop it! <laughs> so, and I just thought, that's, that's too religious for me. I'm not the kind of guy that sits around meditating the Word of God all the way down. This is so simple and so practical. I'm going to teach you how to do it here in just a minute. The word meditate means to ruminate. It literally means to regurgitate. It means you swallow it and bring it up and swallow it and bring it up. And literally, this is not Eastern meditation or something like that, New Age. This is biblical meditation that's talked about here in Psalm chapter 1. And it literally means to take a scripture and put it in your mind and just keep bringing it up to yourself through the day. You just keep thinking about it, literally ruminating on it. And so everything you do will prosper, your marriage ministry, relationships, all of those kinds of things. And so let me talk about why meditation transforms our lives. Let me, so you've got hardware, okay, and you've got software. Now, our, the, our brains are just incredible. I mean, our, our brains are God. God did a masterful job. When he created the human brain, there's never been a, a computer that could come close to the genius of the human brain. They, they have the computers that can do all these calculations and stuff like that, but they can't, they can't make eggs, they can't raise kids, they can't, you know, things like that. So the human brain is incredible. You have brilliant hardware, you have software issues. You've got viruses and things like that. So do I. Human beings, we are born with a fallen brain. We're all born with the fallen brain. Biblical meditation is the process of downloading the right software into our hardware so that we can prosper in everything that we do. Right. Let me remind you of something. God created us, and only God knows how we were created to function. Now, when Karen and I got married, we were um, uh, saved. Uh, I got saved at 19, and we were cursed in our marriage and cursed in our finances. We were saved people that were cursed. Our marriage was cursed. I didn't have any idea. God can only bless his word. God cannot bless anything apart from his word. So anything in our lives that isn't based on the word of God is unblessable. And the word blessing means the supernatural favor and assistance of God. If you want the supernatural favor and assistance of God in any area of your life, you have to base it on his word. So Karen and I almost divorced. I, I didn't know what the Bible said about marriage. I was a terrible husband. On the night that we almost separated, I said, Holy Spirit, teach me how to be a husband. He did. And the Holy Spirit began to teach me what the Word of God had to say about being a husband. And every time we applied another area of the Word to our marriage, the more blessed we were. And after a few months, we were, our marriage was healed. After a few years, we were ministering to other people. 
That's how I came on staff here at Trinity. Uh, I worked for my dad in the appliance business. Uh, but everybody came to us for marriage counseling. And Larry Titus, who was the senior pastor before me, came with me one day in the hall. And he said, hey, I want you to come on staff as a marriage counselor. And I said, I have no credentials to be a marriage counselor. He said, everybody in church comes to you for counseling. You might as well do it up here. <laughs> and Karen and I prayed about it. And I came on staff as a marriage counselor. And 10 months later, he left and I became senior pastor. Our marriage went from being cursed to blessed because of one thing, the Word of God. Our, our finances were cursed. I, I, you know, I didn't grow up in poverty, but I grew up down the street from it. <laughs> and we were just a hard-working, lower-middle-class family. I, I worked from the time I was 10 years old. I've never remembered a time in my life when I didn't work. And my family worked very hard. And when Karen and I got uh, married, I made uh, $600 a month. We had a little baby. Uh, we just struggled to get by. And I had a spirit of poverty, and we went to church one Sunday, and the preacher was preaching on giving. It made me sick. It made me nauseated. I thought I was going to throw up. Uh, we left church. We got home, and I thought, thank God. I'll, I'll never go back to that church again. That guy wants my money, and I want my money worse than he wants my money. <laughs> and uh, Karen came up to me, and she said, you know, I really like that pastor's message today. I thought, oh, my gosh. <laughs> I have married a fanatic. <laughs> well, she started giving. I didn't start giving. I had no faith. She started giving. And I know God because of giving. And the curse, the financial curse upon us, didn't just become a blessing. It became a generational blessing that our children and grandchildren live in today. I'm saying to you this. I'm, I'm saying this to you. The Word of God needs to be something that you fight for in something that is sacred in your life. You need to understand, especially if there are generational curses, which I'm talking about in two weeks. If there are generational curses in your life, you can look back in your life and you can see the sin and disobedience that invoked the curses upon previous generations might even come to your life. How do you get rid of it? You go back to the Word of God. You go back to what the Bible has to say. So let me, let me talk about it. The, the practical process of biblical meditation is very practical. You read what you need. If, so, for example, Romans 8, 1 says, there is, there, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Okay? For the law of spirit of life has set you free from the law of sin and death. I was condemned for the first, I don't know how many years I was saved. I always dealt with condemnation because I didn't understand that God loved me. And the other thing is, I didn't understand I was saved by grace. And grace means it's free. I can't deserve it. I'm not saved. God doesn't love me because of anything I've done. God loves me because of what Jesus did. And every time I sinned, which was quite often, every time I sinned, the devil was on my case, and he was always writing me, condemning me, because condemnation keeps you away from God. You're just not going to run toward a God who's mad at you. And if the devil can constantly convince you that God's mad at you, you're just going to keep your distance from God. The, the devil wins. And I heard someone say one time, every time the devil condemns you, begin to praise Jesus for his blood. Because the devil hates the blood of Jesus because, see, law is about us. Grace is about Jesus. I don't sing how great I am. I sing how great thou art. I'm saved because of the blood of Jesus. And when the devil comes to me and says, Jimmy, you're no good. You don't deserve to be saved. I say, you know, devil, this is one time I'm going to agree with you. But I am not saved by my own merit. I'm saved by the blood of Jesus. Yeah. 2 Timothy 1, 7, God has not given us a spirit of fear. If you're dealing with fear, fear is not your emotion. Fear is a demon entity. Don't host it like it's you. It's not you. But the devil hides in us hoping we won't uncover him. God has not given us a spirit of fear. So when fear comes upon you, don't sit there and think, I'm so fearful. You're not a fearful person. God did not create you with one ounce of fear. Fear comes from the devil. It can come through trauma. It can come through bad experiences in our past that he uses to, to do this through. But if you deal with fear, you stand up and say, spirit of fear, in the name of Jesus, I uncover you. And you're not going to do your work through me. And you're not going to keep me from doing what God has called me to do in my life. I bind you in the name of Jesus and I cast you out. And you align your thinking with the word of God, you're free from fear. You're free from fear. 
uh, discouragement. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. You're no good. You can't do anything. You'll never amount to anything. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. In and of myself, you're exactly right, devil. I'm not that good of a person. I'm not that strong of a person. But in Jesus Christ, I can do anything. I can do any, anything that you're dealing with in life. Just be practical about it. Don't be religious about it. Find the scripture that, that matches where you are. And the other thing is bring it up and meditate on it through the day. Okay. So let me talk about when to meditate because this is the critical part. Deuteronomy 6. These words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and of your gates. Well, these are the four times of the day you're going to struggle most with your thoughts. So the, God, the Word of God is so practical. So God says, I want you to teach your children the Word of God. When do you teach your children the Word of God? When you're laying in bed in the morning when you're laying in bed at night, when you're sitting around the house not doing anything, and when you're riding in the car. This is what this says. It means car. <laughs> when you're going somewhere, it's in the car. That's when you struggle. You know why? Because your mind is contemplative. Let me tell you when you don't struggle. You don't struggle when you're busy. When you're busy doing something and you're engaged, you don't struggle with your thoughts. You don't struggle with stuff as much. But when you're laying in bed and your, your mind is just kind of wandering... In the morning or at night, when you're sitting around the house, watching as the world turns, <laughs> you're, you're really struggling at that minute. You know. When you're riding in the car on a plane somewhere, and you're just very contemplative. Some of you, and some of you old enough, have you ever driven somewhere and can't remember how you got there? Yeah. That's very troublesome, by the way. <laughs> the number of people. Say. That's because you're contemplative. You're, you, you've done it so often, you're just, your mind is somewhere else. That's when you're going to struggle. The Bible is so practical. So let me tell you how to meditate the Word of God day and night. And that is, in the morning, wake up and put a scripture in your mind. It's just like loading a gun. Put a scripture in your mind. You keep that scripture. Very simple. Doesn't have to be complicated. And this is also how you can memorize scripture. Put a scripture in your mind. What are you struggling with? Well, find a scripture that matches that and put it in your mind. And then all day long, when you begin to struggle, listen. You can't take a thought out of your mind. You can only crowd it out with a greater thought. So if I say to you, don't think about a yellow elephant. Don't think about it. Stop it. Don't get it out of you. Stop it. Right? You're going to think about it even more. But if I say to you, think about a purple lizard. Okay, that's good. You can replace a thought with another thought. Let me tell you this. You, you, your thoughts are not as powerful as the devil's thoughts and if you try to engage the devil with your thoughts, he'll wear you out. Only God's word is more powerful than the devil. And so when it's nuclear. The word of God is nuclear. So you, in the morning, you wake up, you put a scripture in your mind, what, whatever scripture that you need, and all day long, you're, rather than sitting around thinking bad thoughts, rather than sitting around being discouraged or being attacked in some way, you bring this up to yourself. Well, let, me, let me tell you one story and I'll close. You know, I was, I was very immoral growing up. Um, I grew up here in Amarillo, and so I, very few neighborhoods I can't drive through and not think about something bad I did there. I was driving through a neighborhood this morning on the way here, and I hit a, well, threw a water balloon at a police car. And <laughs> maybe my friend did it, I can't remember, but I remember the route that we ran uh, trying to get away. But I was real rebellious and uh, immoral. And when Karen and I got married, I got saved, um, and I, I dealt with lust a lot as a young, young, young person, young believer. And I just couldn't do anything about it. I mean, it just, I loved Karen, I was faithful to Karen, but based on my background, I think based on too, I was just a man. I dealt with lust a lot, and I didn't know what to do about it, and you know, I tried everything. And we, Karen and I were on vacation um, in Colorado, where her parents had a place there. And I was sitting in the living room one day, and I noticed a, a book on the table, a coffee table, that was talking about biblical meditation. It was a little booklet. And I picked up the booklet, and I just started reading it, and I didn't, I didn't think I'd enjoy it. The man who wrote the book was a seminary professor who had sold pornography as a kid out of his basement. And he had struggled in his entire life with lust. And I immediately became engaged in the book. And he said, the only thing that will ever set you free from lust 
is meditating on the Bible. And so I read the entire book. What I'm I have a book called The Mindset Free. It's on Amazon if you want. It's just a little booklet. But uh, I read his book, and I memorized the book, and this teaching is based off that book. And um, I began to meditate on Scripture. So let me, tell you, let me tell you how I got set free that quick. Not two seconds, that quick. I've taught this to men all over the world. If you fight lust, you can take cold showers, you can try to cast demons out of yourself, you can do anything you want to do. You will never defeat it until you take your thoughts captive. A bondage is a house of thoughts. And when you're dealing with bad thoughts within your mind, the only way you're going to defeat it is by taking those ca thoughts captive and replacing them with the Word of God. Whatever, it is instant. It frees you just like that. It doesn't take five minutes or five days. It only takes the discipline of understanding the devil's going to meet you every single day to try to defeat you. Every day. It doesn't matter how mature you get in the Lord. It doesn't matter how old you get. The devil's going to meet you every day and try to find some vulnerability that you have so that he can defeat you. And I want you to understand, a mind filled with the Word of God is invincible and cannot be defeated. And the more, every time you defeat the devil, you're building up another fortress in your mind against him that he can't defeat. So I'm saying to you, whatever you're struggling with, depression, fear, condemnation, lust, whatever you're struggling with, I'm saying to you, this is the battlefield right here. This is where Satan's going to attack you right here every single day. The weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but they're divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We're taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. And that's what we have to do. I want you to bow your heads with me if you would. Lord, we come to you and we, we bring lust, fear, worry, anxiety, we bring everything to you, and we pray, Lord, for freedom. We pray for freedom. We believe that your word is the absolute truth of the universe. We believe that your word is the most powerful force in the universe. We believe that your word will align us with your will and cause you to bless us. And we just bring every bondage and stronghold and issue that we're wrestling with. And we bring it to you right now. And we ask you, give us grace, Lord, to take our thoughts captive. We bind discouragement. We bind suicide. We bind depression. We bind fear. We bind condemnation. We bind lust. We bind every spirit that is not of the Spirit of God. And pray, Lord, that you will deliver us and set us free. In Jesus' name, amen. Bless you guys. It's so good. It's so good to have Pastor Jimmy with us. Would you do me a favor? And I just want to do one more prayer here right quick because I believe there are some of us. You may be with us online, maybe at one of our campuses. You may be here in the room. But there are some you haven't yet made Jesus your Lord and Savior. You haven't yet made that choice. And so you know that you have some desires in your life that you would like for your life to go in a different direction but you haven't been able to move in that direction because you haven't yet surrendered to the power of Jesus. You haven't made him the Lord of your life. And I want to encourage you this morning, it's the easiest thing for you to do. And I'm, I'm going to ask you, hold on just a minute, open in your communion for just a minute. Let's just let this just be a, a moment for us this morning. Because I, I want to encourage you, if you haven't made that decision, it's the easiest thing. It says that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, and we believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, in that instant, in that moment, we are transformed. And Jesus comes into our heart, and then he begins to share with us what the Father is saying about us. And that's how we get free. So I want to encourage you this morning, if that's you, if you're saying, I want to make Jesus the Lord of my life, I'm tired of living this way, I'm tired of pressing in this way, I'm tired of being defeated over and over again, I'm ready to make him the boss. If that's you, would you just raise your hand in this room and in every campus that we're at? And if you're at home, you can raise your hand there and just say, I want to make Jesus the Lord of my life. I want to surrender to him. And I want to encourage you to do one more thing with me. Would you text the word decision 
to 797979. We want to connect with you. We want to give you a gift. It's actually a book that Pastor Jimmy wrote. We want to get that to you to help you take the next step that you have in your walk with Jesus. So just text decision to 797979. All right, if you're at home and you're joining us for communion or if you're in one of our campuses, now's a great time to go ahead and take back that first layer and let's go to the, go to the communion table together. I love that we get to have communion with Jesus. Our Jesus is alive. And so when we're here, that may look like just a little wafer, but I want us to remember that Jesus told us to take communion. And when we take communion, he said, I want you to remember me with affection. So what do we remember and why is that so important? It's important because Jesus is alive. Because the thing is, we can't see Jesus physically. So he knew that we would need to be reminded of the truth. Just like the whole message that Pastor preached a while ago. To remember what the truth is. Whatever it is that you've been bombarded with. He said, I want you to take communion. And I want you to remember me. I want you to fill your thoughts with the reality. The reality of Mark 9, 23. Jesus says, all things are possible for those who believe. So here, as you take that bread, we go ahead and break that. And remember that Jesus allowed his body to be broken so that he could make a way for all things to be possible for you and I. We get to be forgiven of every single sin. There's hope. Holy Spirit is given to us to empower us to live out the Christian life. We don't even have to do this thing alone. He's with us. He gives us empowerment to be healed in our physical bodies, in our minds, in our emotions. You know, just this morning I was thanking the Lord I was remembering the things that Jesus has done in our lives things that were impossible in the natural but then with him all things were possible even just one remembrance was five years ago our son had a counter coup concussion and things did not look good and Jesus brought healing to him that he is completely 100% healed. And I've always prayed, God, don't just make everything like that. Okay, they're fine. They're good now. Make him better than ever. That's the kind of God we have. So whatever your situation is, while you're lifting up this bread, you remember Jesus. You gave your body so that you can make a way that all things can be possible for me through you and we thank you think of those things so jesus we just say thank you to you and we remember you with great and deep affection we thank you that with you all things are possible amen now take the bread now if you would you can pull back that next layer and get to the juice and you know, we take this purple liquid to remind us of the blood of Jesus. The blood that was shared to renew us. The blood that was shared to strengthen us. The blood that was shared that gives us access to God's very presence. So would you hold that up? Father, we lift the juice as a reminder of what Jesus did, as a reminder of the sacrifice that you made, but also as a reminder of the promise the promise that's on the other side, the promise of strength, the promise of hope, the promise of your acceptance, the promise of your love, the promise of your peace. And so we take it remembering, but we also take it appropriating, appropriating every resource that we need to be exactly where you want us to be. In Jesus' name, let's take the juice together. Amen. 
Amen. If you would hold on to those cups in every campus, you can throw those away on your way out this morning. We are so delighted to have you here. And can we just thank Pastor Jimmy one more time? It's so awesome having him here with us. We love him so much. So great to have him back. Uh, we're so excited. Let us just pray a blessing over you, and then we're going to dismiss. Go ahead, baby. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we bless this amazing church family with your Father's blessing, the blessing of knowing that we belong to your royal family, knowing that we have an inheritance through Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus, we just pray for that supernatural favor and assistance from God to go before us and to go behind us and surround us with all of your goodness. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.